Okay, so um, that gave us this. Now we're in good shape to use the conversion ratio from our stoichiometric coefficients, because now we've moved things into moles. But we still don't have something that matches our target units, which is grams of ammonia. What, uh, I, I got things mixed up here. Let's go. Our target units were, uh, what were we asking for? How many grams of ammonia? So we're going to need another conversion ratio. Now, logically, we should start by writing down the units that go on the bottom. What units do we need down on the bottom? One mole of NH3. Yeah, moles of NH3. Because I want to cancel these. Mm -hmm. And then approximately uh, 17. Oh, yeah, so you're ahead of me. What units do I put on top? Grams. Grams of what? Yeah, very important to keep putting in the substance because we don't want to confuse these grams with these grams. All right, and you again used your periodic table to work this out. Uh, this isn't going to come out to be a nice even number, but uh, anyway, this is going to be 17 uh, because nitrogen is 14 and there's one each. That would give us 17 grams per mole here. Um, all right, uh, so what number do we get here? What's the answer? Now we need to do the calculation and figure out what the numerical value is. Why do you want this? Ah, well, we did this conversion ratio to get rid of the grams and get moles of hydrogen. But the answer, the question wasn't about hydrogen, it's about ammonia. So I have to get away from hydrogen and move to ammonia. Well, this conversion ratio lets us get away from hydrogen and move to ammonia. And I can't just go, I can't just leave this out because this conversion ratio doesn't interact with this one because this has moles of hydrogen on the top and this is all about ammonia. There always has to be one unit. So the unit on the top of one conversion ratio has to match the unit on the bottom of the next one so that they're going to cancel. So these cannot be connected directly with each other because they don't have any common units. Okay, so they're all connected. I guess I oh yeah, so one thing I should have made clear is these are all multiplications. The equal sign doesn't come here until the end. We're not saying these are equal to each other. We're starting with our starting information. We're doing one multiplication, then another multiplication, then another multiplication. So, um, so some people might do this in, a, in three separate steps. But actually, to save time on the test, it's much better to set it up as a single calculation. So it's actually pretty common in, in chemistry to have unit conversions where you need three or four conversion ratios in a row. And this is the way that you set those up um, as a bunch of multiplications. Um, have you guys ever seen sometimes? In chem chemistry classes, they teach people to do it like this. You ever seen something like this? No? OK. Well, then why are you even bring it up? All right, anyway, I just wanted to point out that um, this is the same as this. It's just that here we can see more clearly what we're doing. We're multiplying by fractions. Uh, but, uh, so it's just as well that you haven't seen this. All right, so we'll get rid of that. But it would be the same basic approach. We're just doing a bunch of multiplications. Uh, but equals doesn't come until the end. All right, so this is a good technique for unit conversions. Um, this is why, again, we want to write down the starting information and the target units. And then you just keep writing down one conversion ratio after another until you've converted from the starting units into the target units. So how do you know when you're done? You're done when you finally got into the target units from the starting units. And these are really the only conversion ratios that would work to get us from one place to the other. All right, but we still have to do a cal numerical calculation to figure out what number this is. So let's try to work that out.
Okay. This is one of the pesky things on the test. It doesn't matter if we set the problem up right if we make a numerical mistake. The fastest way to do this is most people don't realize how important canceling and reducing is on the test. Most of the problems are going to be, since you can't use a calculator, uh, most of the problem, oh, you still can't use a calculator, right? Okay, good. So since you can't use a calculator, um, the problems will be set up to minimize your calculations if you know the tricks. Mm -hmm. But many people don't know the tricks, so they end up wasting a lot of time on calculations. One of the most important tricks is canceling and reducing. For example, do you see how this two cancels with this two? So we never have to do any calculations with those. There's a bunch of cancellations we can do here, but the safest one is just to cancel identical numbers because there's no chance of our making a uh, calculation mistake that way. And then you can reduce. We can reduce the 3 into the 12. Yeah. 3 goes into 12 four times. Ah, that's good. So we end up with 4 times 17. That's the one calculation we're still going to have to do. So let's work out on paper what is 4 times 17. Did you work that out already? OK. Good. All right, so that would give us 68. Now, a lot of people don't look to cancel and reduce. So this is important throughout the test. Look to cancel and reduce. The problems are set up to reward people who do that, to avoid the calculations. If I hadn't done that, I would have ended up doing 12 times 17 which is a long multiplication, it's actually quite rare that you ever have to do long multiplication or long division on the test. It's set up so that you almost never have to do long multiplication or long division. So if you find yourself doing long multiplication or long division, ask if there's a trick that you could have used to avoid that. And in this case, there was. We didn't have to do long division. We just had to do a single digit division, 4 times 17. All right. Um, also, this is the reason why we shouldn't do this as three separate conversions, but do them in one swoop. Because that way, we give ourselves a chance to do the cancellations. This is a good technique in general. Um, this is called, or I call this, postponing multiplication and postponing division, or postponing calculations. It's a good idea to postpone calculations, because maybe they'll disappear later when you can cancel and reduce. Um, so here we postponed the calculations, and many of them disappeared when we canceled and reduced. And this uh, seems like a trivial issue, but actually it can make a big difference in points-wise if you can reduce the number of calculations you have to make during the test. Because uh, under time pressure, people make mistakes on that. Okay, so we ended up with 68 grams. Where does that go in our table? Uh, it doesn't really go in our table. Um, so remember I said we were going to start with the wrong approach and I kind of in, uh, insensibly shifted into the right okay. approach. So the wrong approach was to try to go straight from grams of hydrogen to grams of ammonia. The wrong approach would be try to go from grams to grams directly, and we can't do that because our conversion ratio is in moles, not grams. So it's probably maybe a good idea never to put grams into the start change end table. It was a mistake even to put in grams. Since the stoichiometric coefficients are about moles, we should only put moles into the table, not grams. In fact, on this problem, maybe we don't even need the start change end table that much uh, because we were able to get the answer without really using the start change end table. We could now say that we figured out we figured out that these numbers were 68. And 0 H2. Yeah, we know 0 H2. Um, we never actually figured out directly um, how many uh, moles of H2 we started with because that's buried inside our conversion ratio. So this is a problem where the start change end table wasn't too important. The important thing was to set up the conversion ratio. So you have to use your judgment for when we're going to do that. OK, so um, the general pattern here is we went from grams of A to moles of A to moles of B to grams of B. This is a very common pattern in stoichiometry. In fact, this is by far the most common pattern in stoichiometry problems. They'll give you information about the grams of one substance and ask you about the grams of a different substance. And after, we, after uh, you, they ask you to balance it or to make sure yeah, that Yeah, that's right. Balance. That's right. Well, balancing the equation would be part of solving the problem. That's right. Mm -hmm. And the point is we can't go directly from grams of A to grams of B. We have to take a detour through moles because we're going to use the conversion ratio from the stoichiometric coefficients, and that's in moles. How do we go from grams to moles? Using the periodic table. How do we go from moles to moles? Using these coefficients. And how do we go from moles back to grams? Using the periodic table again. So that's how we get those various uh, conversion ratios. 